The 50 to 57 common era consensus dates for the seven authenticated letters of Paul come with three caveats. The first caveat being that these are consensus dates, not confirmed agreed dates, and there is no unanimous agreement on any of the dates for Paul's letters, only a majority consensus. The second caveat is all of the dates are arrived at solely by reference to entries in Acts of the Apostles, assumed to be a reliable biography of the travels, preachings and deeds of the Apostles, mainly Paul, after the death of Jesus. The author or authors of Acts are assumed to be historians recounting historical events, but viewing Acts as historical content in order to date the letters of Paul is questionable. Acts is riddled with ridiculous, fantastic miracle claims. In Acts, there are accounts of the apostles conversing for 40 days with a person who is actually dead, the dead person saying goodbye to the apostles by levitating up into the sky on a cloud, dead people being brought back to life by the apostles, mainly Paul, Judas walking into a field and spontaneously exploding, a man and then his wife falling dead on the spot for lying to the apostles about how much they sold their property for, demons running screaming from people's bodies and houses when the apostles arrive in town, Paul curing lameness by simply touching people, and handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched Paul being used to cure the sick and exercise the possessed. In addition to these somewhat ridiculous and physically impossible claims, we have the issue of a narrative which changes from Paul and they to us and we and back again on several occasions. This indicates more than one author and the creation of late interpolations into the text. But the main observation would be that the Paul of the epistles is an apocalyptic preacher preaching the imminent end of the world within the current lifetime. The Paul of Acts is a completely different, softer character, preaching redemption after death for faith in Jesus. The Paul in Acts never once mentions the imminent end of the world. Conversely, the Paul of the Epistles never mentions any acts of miracle healing, restoring to life of the dead, or any ability to expel demons. In short, the Paul who wrote the Epistles is not the Paul depicted in the work called Acts of the Apostles, Therefore, Acts is not a biography of the Paul of the Epistles. It is a fiction. Moreover, it is a fiction written about the envisaged travels of Paul, which also places Paul into the required time frame selected by the author or authors, and with no regard to when Paul actually lived and preached. We could ask, why would a work such as Acts of the Apostles need to be created? I believe the answer would lie in the questions that would inevitably arise from any potential worshippers after the release of the post-70 Common Era Gospels, all of which repeat Paul's end of the world in our lifetime prophecy. It would not be long before a following would say, but that generation are now all past and the new kingdom promised has not arrived. Hence the creation of the new softer message in Acts, a message that does not promise an imminent end of the world, but rather redemption after your own death as a reward for unquestioning faithfulness to the Jesus of their Gospels. In essence, the authors of Acts would appear to have made up a story about the activities of the Apostles to explain events after the death of the canonical Jesus with an emphasis on Paul by way of using Paul's letters as a reference. In error, 19th century theological scholars have accepted Acts as a factual biography of the Apostles, and then used its contents to calculate dates for Paul's letters and Paul's activities. Given that scholarship today uses Acts, and Acts alone to date the letters of Paul, means that it is the author or authors of Acts of the Apostles who have decided when it was that Paul lived and preached, not modern scholars and modern scholarship has unquestionably accepted their dating. The third caveat is that many of the scholars who support the consensus dates have assumed scenario A to be proven and scenario B to be false, and this is not the case. 
Therefore, the supremacy of scenario A should not be assumed. In assuming scenario A to be factual, a precondition is then automatically applied to the dating of Paul's letters before any analysis of the text begins. This precondition being that the letters must have been written after 33 Common Era, because that is the consensus date for the latest possible crucifixion date under scenario A. In reality, the letters should be dated using the text within the letters alone without any regard to any constraints that might be placed on the dating process by either scenario A or B. After obtaining possible dates for the letters by way of analysing the text within the letters, the dates obtained could then be used to judge which of scenario A or B would be the more likely to be true. The second and third caveats on the dating method for the consensus dates for Paul's letters mean that the methods employed by theological scholars to obtain these consensus dates are fundamentally flawed. It is not so much that the consensus dates for Paul's letters have a high probability of being wrong, it is more that they have an extremely low probability of being correct. Why is this flawed dating rubric important to highlight? When looking for the earliest possible crucifixion date for a scenario A Jesus, we can only use the prefixture dates of Pontius Pilate, 26 to 36 Common Era. The main indication is that the crucifixion was on a Passover during the prefixture of Pontius Pilate. So, if any document were to exist, written before 26 Common Era, which demonstrated belief in a dying and rising demigod named Jesus, Scenario B would be categorically proven and Scenario A completely disproved. I am not contending here, at this stage, that Paul's letters were written before 26 Common Era, but I am highlighting that, if they were, that possibility has been immediately dismissed by the scholarship in the field due to the flawed manner in which Paul's letters have been dated. That aside, I will propose a date pre-26 Common Era after having reviewed Paul's seven authenticated letters. Also of importance when looking at the methods used to date Paul's letters is the assumed idea that Paul is the first Christian to take the Christian message to the Gentiles and therefore Paul created the churches that he sends his letters to. This presentation also challenges this premise and will demonstrate that Paul did not create the Christian churches he writes to, but rather they already existed and already worshipped a dying and rising demigod named Jesus. These Gentile Jesus churches had held the view that worshipping Jesus would ensure spiritual salvation long before the congregations came into contact with Paul. Paul approaches these churches with what he claims is a new message about Jesus, the good news, as in gospel, that he is bringing to them after a claimed communication to him directly from this Jesus demigod by way of an apparition. This claimed apparition is Paul's good news, or Paul's gospel, and Paul's message is an apocalyptic one. The message informs the churches that Jesus has indicated to Paul that he will arrive on earth soon to usher in the next age by destroying this present evil age. And this will happen presently in their lifetimes. Paul therefore informs the churches of what they need to do to be ready and how to be right with God when the event occurs. The Christian conversions that Paul speaks of in his epistles are conversions from existing Christologies over to Paul's new apocalyptic message about Jesus and alongside brand new converts to Christianity from among the congregations of the Gentile pagan religions. This approach to reading and dating Paul's letters is viewing the situation from a completely different angle to any that has gone before. But then, it is true to state there is no evidence to date that can be used to prove that the orthodox view of Paul creating the Gentile churches he writes to is accurate. We certainly cannot derive that situation from the text of Paul's letters alone. There is, therefore, no sound logical basis for assuming that the accepted consensus view is correct. It is the work called 
Acts of the Apostles that gives the impression that Paul was the first Christian to create Gentile Christian churches and that he created from new the churches he writes to. But then that was the intended impression to be given by the very people who wrote Acts of the Apostles, written somewhere between 100 and 150. To support this scepticism of the consensus view, we can take for an example the fact that Acts informs us that Paul is from Tarsus, his Hebrew name is Saul, and he is a Roman citizen. However, the reality is Paul does not tell us where he is from, or that his name was Saul, or that he has Roman citizenship. This is all added, or implied, or invented by the authors of Acts. All Paul says is, in Philippians 3.5, Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee. We therefore do not know where Paul was from, and with the present extent documentation we have no way to find out. There are many other examples we could interrogate here, but one major item is Paul being present at, and overseeing, the stoning to death of the first recorded Christian martyr, Stephen. This is in Acts, and only in Acts. Paul makes no such indication in his letters. Paul only claims to have formally persecuted the Church of God. And more to the point, there are many levels of persecution we could categorise, from simple verbal persecution, through social persecution, to physical and violent persecution. Paul does not indicate to us the level of persecution he conducted. Rainer Reisner's work on a Pauline chronology, Paul's early period, informs us that from circa 1600 through to around 1850 there had been six notable attempts at reconciling Paul's letters to the information about Paul in Acts of the Apostles in order to produce a dated chronology for Paul. From 1850 to 1900 a further six chronologies had been proposed. None of the twelve attempts could agree. Differing in the crucifixion date by four years, Paul's conversion date by ten years, Paul's last visit to Jerusalem by seven years, and the gap between Paul's conversion to Paul's last visit to Jerusalem differing by seven years ranging from 18 to 25 years. The problem for these twelve scholars was, there are no anchors in Paul's letters, although there is one, a reference to King Aratus, which is conveniently ignored because of the dating problems it causes. And there is only one major anchor in Acts, a mention of Gallio being the proconsul of Achaia, but Gallio did not appear anywhere in the historical record. In 1905, nine stone fragments from a temple near Delphi were revealed to be an address from Claudius to his proconsul Gallio in Achaia. They were dated to 51 Common Era, and this was a significant find. It was a reference to the governor Gallio of Achaia mentioned in Acts 18.12. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him into the place of judgment. This meant, at last, scholars could use Acts to try to create a dated chronology for Paul's letters. So after 1905, work started in earnest. Reisner's work indicates that over the following 87 years, as at 1992, there are a further 17 attempts of noteworthiness at recording the order of Paul's letters, the order of Paul's travels, and the dates for Paul's main headline events. For all three of these attempted chronologies, not one of the 17 attempts are in accord, nor do they agree with the 12 previous attempts, 29 attempts in all. There are more, these are just the ones that Reisner highlights and discusses. Reisner's own work does no more than add disparate attempt number 30. This failure to find a convergent agreement for a chronology derived from a reconciliation between Paul's letters and his supposed biography in Acts is for a good reason. All the scholars attempting the reconciliation assume that scenario A is given and that Acts is a reliable history record. But if scenario B were to be the actual case, in that Paul's Jesus is a mythical demigod and Acts is a complete fabrication about Paul taken from Paul's letters 
placing Paul into the author of Acts' own personally selected timeline, the task for the scholars would be impossible, and impossible it does seem to be proving to be. The reality is, Acts is pure fiction written by an unknown author or authors that use the apocalyptic preacher from history known as Paul as their main character. It is the creators of the story in Acts who have decided when and where they wanted their particular Paul to have existed, and this is done to carefully coincide with regard to when and where their particular Jesus is purported to have existed. This concludes parts 1 and 2 of a six-part presentation on the chronological evolution of Christ. In parts 3 and 4 I will critically review the seven authenticated letters of Paul to ascertain realistic dates for Paul derived solely from the content of the letters. So, unlike Reisner et al, without regard to any of the data from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John or Acts of the Apostles, documents that did not exist at the time that Paul evangelised about his Jesus. Parts 3 to 6 of this presentation will also be posted to my YouTube channel Notori UK, so please do visit the channel and subscribe to be notified of when they arrive.